Hi, everybody. Welcome to our weekly live event where we talk about real estate, finance, investing, retirement planning, and business creation. So whatever your questions are, I'm happy to help. As you guys know, I'm Bascal Corcus, and uh, we're going to be doing a lot of Q&A, and uh, we're going to be talking about the coronavirus, how it's affecting the economy, and what's to come in the near future, in the next 9 to 12 months. So to answer a question that was uh, submitted, which was, uh, what are my thoughts about cash? Normally, I do not like holding cash. First, let's talk about cash. Um, something I want to point out here when we talk about cash. Um, this is legal tender, right? Federal Reserve note. It talks about right here. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So I want you to understand this is not really money. Like it's we're told it's money. It's not money. See, this is money. Gold is money. Cash is used to transfer. Is a is considered for a transfer. It's not really money. It's really an IOU from the government, and the government's IOU says, "Hey, this is worth something." The American government is backing it. We promise you, it's worth something. And you can use it as an exchange of value. Now, to the point, though, this is actually a loan. All the money you have in your checking account, all the cash, is actually a loan. So you would say, but Pascal, loans, you pay interest on loans, right? And yeah, there's there's most of the loans we experience, we pay an interest rate. If you have a credit card loan, it's like 18%. If you have a car loan, it's going to be like 5%. If you have a home loan, right now we're about 3.5%. So this is a loan from the government to the people where we're using this. There is a there is an interest we're paying. It's basically it's the devaluation of the dollar or inflation of assets. So every year, this dollar will only be able to buy $97 worth of the previous year's goods. So if you add a whole basket of goods in your grocery store, the next year usually you need $103 to buy the same stuff. That is the imaginary or the, the, the invisible interest that we're paying from this money. So it's really a loan. So what I normally do is I don't keep this loan. And some people will say, take your cash and pay down your loan. I said, well, why are you going to take a loan that has an invisible 3% interest to pay down another loan on a real estate? It doesn't make sense because they're roughly the same interest rate. Really, you need to use this to go and buy more assets because as the dollar devaluates and the loans we have devaluate, the asset itself keeps going up in value. And that's how you have such a huge, that's how you make so much money in the real estate game. Because if you owned $100,000 today, in 10 years from now, the $100,000 is only going to have the purchasing power of $70,000 of the 10-year period. So meaning, in 10 years from now, if you wanted to buy $100,000 worth of stuff, you would need $130,000. So... In 10 years from now, that $100,000 loan is going to be way easier to pay back. That is why you need to take your cash, which is really not money. It's, it's, a, it's not real money. Gold, silver is real money. Um, you would then use that money to go and buy assets with loans. And then the, the dollar devaluates as the asset appreciates and you make that margin. In between, and that's how you make such a huge margin. So a lot of times, is you the, the the old saying was, you don't wait to buy real estate; you buy real estate and wait. Today is a little different. I'm gonna say wait because we have a major uh, global catastrophe that from the pandemic. Uh, so we will need to wait. So the assets, real estate, the good thing and the bad thing is in real estate is that real estate takes more time to get affected than the stock market. It's going to take us about nine to 12 months to feel what happened in the stock market in the real estate market. So that means good for you guys. you got a lot of time to get ready. I'm selling the stuff I don't love, all my small stuff, all my big assets I'm keeping because I like them. And I'm going to get ready to get my cash together 
to answer the question, I'm getting my cash together so I can start buying those big deals at big discounts. So normally I don't like cash, but I'm willing to shift into cash because the real estate values are going to go down. And if you own a single family home or a duplex and you're planning to sell, sell now, then later. So I'm selling them now, getting ready in 12 months, because I'll have between 12 to 24 months is where the, it's going to be kind of like the bottom part of it, where I'm going to be picking them up, picking picking up more and more assets at a discount. And it's going to stay low. It's going to go up slowly because the people that get hurt from this, from this drop, it's going to take them time to recover. It's going to take them years to recover. So there's going to be a lot of supply and everyone's going to want to buy the real estate. But what we have to understand is just because there's a supply and people want to buy it doesn't mean they're capable of buying it, which gives us the opportunity to come in and pick up those assets that other people are not able to get. And then real estate takes a while to recover. So it takes a while for those people to finally be able to buy the assets back. And by that time comes in, the asset value is a lot higher. And we're going to be able to make that money. So that is why I normally do not like cash. But right now I'm shifting into cash because the assets are going to fall faster than cash depreciates. So that's why I'm going to take that shift short term. And then I'm going to get out of cash again, picking up as many assets as possible during this sale that we're going to be getting. And the sale is going to be coming between nine, nine to 12 months. Right. And if you watched my old my video from um, six months ago on my IG channel, on my IG page, you'll see that I said something is going to happen that's going to cause the market to fall. Something. And that something happened to be a huge thing. Right. And we didn't even need a pandemic to make our economy fall like this. It just happened to be the 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 huge thing that that did happen that is now affecting our market. Um, so. Great question, George. Um, now, the set other follow-up question says, is your philosophy closer to Ray Dalio or Warren Buffett? To be honest, I take on both, both uh, philosophies because Warren Buffett is, um, is, is uh, his uh, mentor was Benjamin Graham. And I read ben 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 Benjamin Graham's book back when I was like 19, 18. And it is Intelligent Investor. It's a very good book to read. And it's mostly talking about the stock market. But if you apply that same concepts in the book to any asset class, which I applied it to the real estate market, it has great concepts. So buying and holding, great concept. Um, buying based off of cash flow and based off of um, you know the real value, not on speculation. I agree with that as well. A lot of people will speculate in real estate, just like in the stock market. If you speculate in the real estate market, you're going to really hurt yourself because you're guessing and you're gambling. I don't gamble on my real estate deals. I know when I'm buying a deal, I'm making money. And I, I buy off cash flow, same thing like Warren Buffett does. But I also diversify similar to Warren Buffett and Ray Dilio. So I really pick up both of them because I also read Ray Dilio's book. So I do take bits from each of them and from actually multiple investors and take different aspects that I like and I bring it in and I, and I use them. Right. Um, in the similar way that Warren Buffett invests, I'm doing something similar in a small scale. So Warren Buffett bought Geico and he bought, um, I forget a couple other companies, but multiple uh, banks, multiple different financial services businesses. So, and then he uses that. So for my examples, I bought an insurance, I opened an insurance agency. So Warren Buffett bought Geico, but I bought insurance agencies that bring me cash flow every month, just like he owns Geico and brings in cash flow every month. And then from there, I also own accounting firms, things that people have to use, good or bad economy. Car insurance, home insurance, people have to use a good economy, bad economy. I'm opening up a mortgage company. That's also going to be good, good economy and bad economy. Refinancing and, and bad economies, new purchases and good economy. So um, doing similar things, and I'm using that money to go out and buy assets that have great value, you know, value investing. But I value and invest specifically in real estate because we get that great thing of being able to leverage, you know, five to one. You know, you put down 20%, the bank puts down uh, the other 80%, and now you're also bringing in more cash flow. On top of that, you get the depreciation. So I'm, I am taking their styles and I'm creating a hybrid for my plan. Eventually, I'll be creating out something special for you guys in the next probably year, year and a half, where you guys are going to be able to work from home 
and do taxes, insurance, mortgages, and make the same money to bring in cash and have extra cash to go out and invest in real estate. So now you're bringing in cash and investing your wealth into assets for your retirement and to create generational wealth. But that's going to be coming later. We're not really going to talk about that today, but I am working on it. And honestly, the big thing why I'm doing the Instagram and YouTube is because I have this great, great idea that's going to help millions of Americans. And for me to be able to put it out, because I already talked to a fintech company about putting it out and they said, it's a great idea. The thing is I need a lot more followers. If I can get a lot more followers on my different accounts, when I come out with this app, we'll have enough users to make it function because it's all about user base. Airbnb launched seven times before they actually made it. They had to launch seven different times. So that's why I want to avoid the seven launch launches when we come out with the app. Um, so great question, George. You're always coming in with great questions. Um, so uh, Anderson says, still waiting on what's new. Uh, I, I don't know what the question is. Sorry. Eric says, I'm looking into cashing out my 401k to buy my first multi-unit property. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I th thank you. I think you mentioned it being penalty free right now. So normally when you buy your first property, your residential home, you can take out up to $10,000 out of your 401k and it is penalty free. It is not tax free. It is penalty free. So you're still going to have to pay the tax on a, um, traditional 401k. Now, if you have a Roth 401k, you already prepaid the taxes and you can take up to $10,000 without having a penalty. Now, because of the coronavirus, they shifted it to $100,000. You could take out $100,000 out of your 401k and avoid a penalty. Now, that does not avoid the tax on a traditional 401k. And if you have a Roth 401k, then you already paid the tax, so you wouldn't be taxed now on the withdrawal. Um, you might be taxed on the earnings. That you would have to have to look into further. So back to the 401k part. The original question was about using a 401k to buy real estate. I did that myself because to be honest, the 401k market and the pension market is kind of rigged. The amount of fees that they withdraw, it's like at least 2% over 40 years that you're going to have your money in an IRA or a 401k or a pension. It's just so much, so many fees uh, that the funds are charging that it is not really worth it. In my opinion, in my opinion, for myself, I'm not telling anybody else what to do. Um, I take my money and I invest it in real estate because the returns on investment are significantly higher. George says, because Ray is more diversified, he says he takes the same return on many different uncorrelated businesses, but when Warren has $128 billion in cash, he is ready to invest 100 of that amount. Yes, Warren does have a lot more cash. And but you got the part where they have the similarity is Warren also is diversified, you know. The one difference, though, is Warren is very old school, and he doesn't invest in technology, and he doesn't invest in any type of product he doesn't understand. So there is similarities, and there are some differences in investment style. The fact that Warren has a bunch of cash is also different uh, because a lot of that is some of his own money, you know. So and he focuses on getting really great deals. So I don't feel they're that far apart. Yes, there is differences, but I don't think they're that far apart. Um, so, and I think if you're asking me who am I like, I'm a mix of both because I'm like Ray where I spend almost all of my cash, right? Minus what's happening right now. Almost all of my cash is constantly going out into new businesses, new investment deals where right now I'm saving money like Warren and stacking up that cash and sitting on the side and waiting. Now, I am thinking of probably putting some of my cash into gold because I do think gold has a good opportunity of going up probably up to – it could go as high as 3000 It's really possible because people don't realize how bad things are going to get. And when they freak out, everyone kind of runs to gold. So uh, Grandma says, hey, Pascal, huge fan. I am a buy and hold investor in Connecticut. I am looking for a bird opportunity in Tampa for my mom when she retires. 
any reliable wholesalers you can connect me with? To be honest, no, <laughs> no. I get deals all the time and I've not found, I've only gotten one in three years that was actually a good deal. They're normally not a good deal. There's normally not much money left in it. Now, I'll be honest with you, the competition is so high that people are paying dumb money for, for properties. So it's really hard. Now, again, if you wait for nine to 12 months, more of 12 months, you're going to find some really good deals. And you probably won't even need a wholesaler. You'll be able to find good deals on the market. So I'll give you the, remember I was posting on my, on my IG story, I put out um, a post about this house that was on fire and it was in a good area and they were asking like 92,000. Well, that house was bid up to $158,000. The house remodels only worth 250. So you're telling me you're gonna buy this house, spend 50, 60,000 to get it up and running. You're going to be in, in it for 220. At 250, you're going to have closing costs of around like 15, 16 thousand dollars. And you're only going to make 20 thousand dollars. That's just not worth it. People are crazy right now with what they're doing. So and again, the bidding hasn't even finished. The auction isn't over until uh, Thursday. So that's insane. It's already 158. Like by the time that the auction ends, between the cost of the property, the remodeling, and the closing cost, ignoring any carrying costs, you're going to break even. It's just right now, it's a crazy time. So if let's put it like this, uh, Grimaud's, you find a good deal anywhere, take it. It doesn't matter who it comes from. But am I finding any good deals from wholesalers? No, I have not. Um, I wish I did. So George, George's comment says, at one of his biographies, it states that Warren is willing to go hard on one deal if it's safe, but Ray is not. Hmm. So I don't know. It's, it's hard to like, I hear what you're saying, George. And then George follows up. What is your opinion on selling two years ago, your cash put them on 30 year T bills, wait until the interest drops, and then you go and buy in discount in place like Texas. So George, you're, you're making some really big assumptions that the best investors in the world don't even know to do, right? Like it is so easy to look back in time and say, we're going to do uh, X, Y, or Z. Like the odds of that happening is very rare, right? Uh, to be able to call the market that well. Um, normally, I'm not too worried about it because my my hedge against inflation in the dollar is not in T-bills, but it's in the mortgages that I have. Because what the mortgages you have are play against the dollar. As they print more dollars, you win on how big your mortgages are. Think about that. Because every time they print more dollars and the dollar devaluates, the mortgages you hold decrease value. And normally at that point, interest rates drop so you can refinance and make your, 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 your actual debt and the payment even cheaper. So it's very easy to win that way. And I'm, it's, I don't have to speculate on what they're going to do on T-bills and what's going on with X, Y, and Z because I know that the asset I'm buying brings me in consistent income. Back to Warren's, to Warren's style. I'm going to have to agree with Warren because, again, I do both, right? with um and i do spread my money across but if i find a sick real estate deal i will cash out everywhere and put it down into the deal because if it is an amazing deal i am willing to go hard enough on it the back i will agree on warren buffett meant, said this one thing he said diversification is meant for people that do not know what they're doing but if you know what you're doing, you don't need to diversify in 15, 20 different stocks. You can be in just five and be fine. But diversification is, again, for people who, who don't really know what to do. If a person was managing their business well, let's just use the airlines, for example. They kept buying back their stocks. That's why they're in such a bad position. If they actually kept their cash, 
they would not be stuck like this. So Disney Entertainment Company, they have $6.5 billion in cash. Yes, they have cruises. They have amusement parks. A majority of their money comes from cruises and amusement parks. They're very profitable for them. So the point is they're still doing fine because they're, they're doing well in their business. Did they also diversify? Yes, they did. They were smart. They also did diversify. But my point is they were smart enough to keep cash and to be able to be prepared in case things happen in the business cycle. Many people predict, predicted that, there's, that the market was going to fall, but not everyone prepared. And that's where we come in to go and be able to buy up all these deals from everyone who did not plan accordingly. Jit, jit, um, Machia Mat, Mat, says, would you consider running real estate business in Europe as well? Yes, I would consider running a real estate business in any country. Uh, one of my followers actually has an Airbnb, um, has Airbnbs in Austria, which is uh, very profitable for him. So this plan works in every country. It, it's not limited um, to just America, right? It works in Canada. It works in Mexico. People send me deals, and when I'm doing the consultation and I'm running their deals, I'm running deals on, in Mexico for, for them in Mexico. Do I know the rental market? Do I know certain factors? No, I don't know the, the, Me the Mexican rental market, but I can run mathematical equations to determine to say, hey, what is your profitability and are you going to make money over time? And again, the deals in all the different countries make sense as long as you're buying a good deal. You're not overpaying. So George's uh, follow-up comment says, he doesn't, but he has two guys managing $18 billion. They are, I think Warren said, at on one of his interview. Okay. Fishy says, is there any helpful apps we should have on our phone that pertain to real estate? I have um, Zillow. I have Realtor. I'm constantly on there searching for multi-unit families in my area and just keeping up with what's the cost of everything, the price, and what they go for in different areas. Because when the market changes, I have to know what is it worth in one city and the other city. Otherwise, you might get stuck and think it's a great deal, but in reality, it's not. Now, I also have um, like Google Drive and OneDrive on my phone with Excel spreadsheets for my rentals, and I have Performa statements that I can run on properties that I'm looking at on my phone. So I can normally in my mind, I'm like calculating it and I can figure it out pretty quickly. Like, okay, this is a good deal. From that point that I say, okay, this is a good deal. Now I put it into the Excel spreadsheet to verify I'm not skipping anything and to be like, okay, now it really looks like a good deal. Let me go in person and see if there's anything mechanically wrong. Now, if it's cheap enough, I won't even look at it and I'll say, I will buy it. Like, no, no problem. Like the the Safety Harbor project was like nine hundred fifty thousand. The price they were asking nine fifty. Nine fifty was cheap for that property. I said I'll buy it. They didn't even care what a, what was wrong with it. Um, but there's properties that are for sale that are one hundred fifty that are expensive. So I won't even waste my time going to look at it. So cheap is not based on price. Cheap is based off of value that you're receiving or the the value of the property you're buying. So. Um, those are the three, four things that I have on my phone that I focus on. Um, oh, I also have like uh, the app, that one app where you like, um, if you find a property that you're interested in, it's not for sale, you can put the address in your in your phone and then they'll, they'll start mailing the person postcards. It costs about $60 a month for that. And then it costs another like 10, 20 cents every postcard they send, something like that. I don't know exactly how much it is, but... Um, I haven't actually gotten any deals off of that yet, but you're supposed to put 200 properties in before you get a deal. And I have only put in like 30. So uh, we'll see if it uh, works out. But if I can save 10, 20,000 on one deal, it'll be worth me paying a hundred dollars a month for a year, you know? <sighs> Rennie says, uh, Pascal, great job on this channel. I'm a big fan. I went to cash out my 401k. 
of 10K in order to finish a remodel in my house and rent it out and move on to another home. Your thoughts? Good idea? Question mark. Um, so now you're allowed to take up up to $100,000 out of your 401k without getting a penalty. You still have to pay the taxes if there's taxes due. I cannot say it's a good idea because you actually have to run the numbers to determine it's a good idea, right? Like you have to say how much is the money going to, how much money you're taking out? What is the additional value you're adding for the resale? What's additional value you're adding on renting? Now, normally, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is not a good idea to rent out a home. Cash flow wise, it's better to rent out a duplex, triplex, or quadplex. And remember, if the market's going to go down in nine months, your asset's going to go down. So if you're going to remodel, you need to be able to remodel fast enough to get it done. Then you should be doing a cash out refinance to stabilize that asset and then sit on the cash to look for another property. If you're saying you're going to buy another home right now, it is a very bad idea because they're going to drop significantly in nine to 12 months. So you don't want to put yourself in a position today where you're going to be in a negative position 12 months from now. So let's sit back and be patient on that. Now, if you're planning, you're going to rent this house out or you want to sell it, it's probably a good idea to remodel it now and get rid of it now. Because if you don't get rid of it now, you're not going to be able to sell it for a decent price for at least another five years. So definitely see playing out. Because right now, what the move decisions we have to make now are going to be five-year decisions. And in five years from now, you got to think, do I want to be wealthy? Do I want to be significantly have significantly more assets than I do today? Or do I want to be stuck with assets that I don't really love? Because again, keep what you love and sell everything you don't. If you're just like, eh, I kind of like it, get rid of it, sell it. Because when the market tanks, all the things you kind of like, you're not going to like them because they're going to give you more problems. There's, you know, I don't know how many of you went through 2008. I went through 2008 at 23 units. I had about eight vacant at one time, you know, it was, you know, it was a very tough time. And um, it was normally the process properties I did not love that gave me the most issues. So that is my uh, warning. Walid says, uh, you said you have an insurance brokerage and you will be getting into mortgage industry. Do you have a background in the industry or will you be hiring associates? I do have a background. I started working at the bank when I was like 18. Uh, I started doing mortgages when I was 19. I was like top uh, producer for mortgages, bank accounts, credit cards in the region every quarter that, that I worked there. Um, I have experience in insurance, I have experience in credit, I have experience in accounting. So I've not studied. I actually worked in every single one of those positions. I did anti-money laundering with Citigroup. I worked at Bank of America as a banker. I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers doing Home Depot's tax returns. Um, so. I actually have real experience in each job. So I can literally get into the seat and do that job. So I'm not just the owner of a company that's kind of hires people that knows what they're doing. I actually know how to do each job. When I was 14, I was doing construction. So I know how to fix roof. I know how to wire. I know how to plumb. I know how to tile. So when I'm watching people do my jobs, I actually know what they're doing. Do you have to know as much experience as I do? You don't. But my passion is this. So I like, I don't watch sports, right? I like, powerlifting. I like mixed martial arts and I like business. And that's really what I absorb my time with. So that's why I know this much. You guys don't need to know that much. Um, you just need to focus on the important parts. And that's what I'm trying to do. Give you just the important parts so you guys can be able to grow and scale and build wealth. And um, if you want to learn the other things, you're more than welcome to. It's great to learn. Not important though. Uh, will I be hiring associates? Yes, I will be hiring associates. And eventually when I put out my app, we'll probably have thousands of associates on the app that are going to be working from home and making uh, a lot more money than they would be working for banks. The what leads follow-up question is, what kind of money do you need to start these type of businesses? You don't need money per se. Uh, like opening an insurance agency, you don't need a lot of money. The thing is, you have to be willing to work for free for many years. It takes about three years before an insurance agency makes money. So you will be working for free for three years. How did I? How was I able to work for free for three years? 
When I was 19, I started buying real estate. By 23, I had 23 units. So when I opened up my insurance agency when I was 27, I could work for three years for free because I had money coming in from my rental business. And then when if the rental business gets rough, when the economy gets rough, my insurance agency is going to bring me money. So I'll be able to balance, right? You're able to balance and I'll be able to um, basically the cash flows when the, each business goes up and down, I'll be able to balance. So I, I'm always consistently making about the same cash. So I'm not sweating it, you know, when things get tough. Same thing with accounting firm. You can open an accounting firm. It's not that expensive to start doing bookkeeping for people or doing taxes for people. Uh, you need to be educated though. Someone needs to show you and teach you something. And that's part of what the app is going to be doing. And so we're going to be taking people that don't know anything, showing them and teaching them the business, and then they can start doing it at home on the app and uh, on the, the website. So, um, so that's a whole, it's an education process and then they'll be able to go and do work. Um, so uh, Jorge Martinez says, which app is this? This is the app I'm actually working on creating with a FinTech company. So we had, I have this app that I've been wanting to build for a long time. I went to this company and they said, yeah, it's a great idea, but you, oh, building the app, you know, it's going to cost us around $250,000 to build it. So he, they're like, there's no point of you paying this money to build it because I could get it built and have it done in three months. If, if we don't have thousands of people using it, it won't matter. It's kind of like Airbnb. Airbnb launched seven times, seven, yeah, nine, seven uh, times to before they um able to get enough users for the app to, to fully function. So once I'm able to build a big, big enough social media presence, uh, on Instagram and on um, YouTube. Again, just make sure you tell your friends to follow. We'll we'll have enough followers. So eventually, when I come out that with the app, I'm planning to come out in a year. So um, again, the the second I have a lot of followers, we're going to be able to put it on three months. But I'm thinking to get a million followers on Instagram to probably work up to a million followers on YouTube. It's going to take me probably another year. So at that point, then we'll be able to put out the app and. Um, be able to get people. So what the concept is, they're going to be able to, people are going to be able to buy financial services from the app cheaper than all the other locations. And at the same time, people from their home can start their own small business and work on the app and make more money than they would working for a bank. So they're going to make double the money they work for a bank from home. So it's, imagine it, it's like um, an Uber for financial services, or it's like an Airbnb for financial services where uh, we'll handle all the legal aspects on the app. We'll handle all the legal and, and the documentation part of things. And you guys just focus on, you know, customer service and taking care of the client. So uh, that's the basic concept of that. Machia says, since real estate prices will drop around during 12 to 24 months. Should we just save money and wait for good deals then? What else to do until drop happens? So you must study your market because they're going to start dropping from nine to 12 months. And at nine to 12 months, it's probably going to about starting the, like, again, if a great deal comes up now, buy it now. But a lot of great deals are going to be coming up in 12 months. So between that 12 to 24 month period is a great buying opportunity. You need to study your market because you won't know what's a good deal. Most of the time, the people's issues is they don't know what's a good deal. So even in a in a great economy, or they're they're overpaying, and then in a bad economy, they're overpaying because the price you pay is based on the market condition. So if the market is bad, you should be getting a great deal, not an okay deal, right? So you need to study your market. You need to educate yourself. So you need to spend this next twelve months and absorb all of my videos. You need to teach yourself all of this because. When it's time to come, you want to make sure that you're doing every single part the best possible, you know, execute it the best way possible so you can get a, an amazing result, right? You don't want to waste your time and end up buying a duplex when you could have bought a fourplex. You don't want to end up making, you know, in the next five years, 100000 where you could have built 300000 in wealth. So you have to study so you can be able to know and pull the trigger. Why I like real estate is this. You can sit in front of a computer and day trade all day and do this and that and make you know ten thousand dollars a month. I make one real estate deal. I made one real estate deal. I'll tell you a story. My wife 
was complaining. Oh, Pascal, you're not going into the office. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. I'm like, look, I'm wasting my time going into the office. I can be doing a lot of things to make more money than I'm doing going into the office. I said, look, make believe I go to sleep, stay in bed for six months straight, like hypothetically. If I pull one deal, one good deal, I can make more money in that one deal than I would make 10 years working. So what did I do? I spent my time, not in bed, but I spent my time focusing on developing myself and paying attention to the market. That Safety Harbor deal came out. I bought it for $950,000. I spent $500,000 on it, right? It's worth $3.2 million. In that one deal, I made $1.5 million. Now, again, I'm not selling it because I want to keep it. It's a great property because I think it's really worth $4.2 million. So one deal. You don't want to get distracted from all that noise in the stock market. That's my opinion. You know, you can spend the time to study your market, to pull your trigger on one deal and make all the money you would have made and more on the real estate market. So Clark says, do you offer consultations on real estate deals? Uh, yes, my accounting firm does. So we're an accounting, my accounting firm specializes in real estate investment. So not only do we do consulting for real estate deals, we also can create the LLC for you. We can do the tax returns, the bookkeeping, we can do payroll. We're full service. We have clients internationally. We have clients all over the world. So we're full service. We also do insurance in Florida. So if you need real estate insurance and you have deals in Florida, we can handle that for you as well. So like uh, one of my followers she wanted to buy a condo. I told her, do not buy a condo. Finally, she's like, well, it's not possible for me to find a duplex in Miami. I said, look, it's possible if you make it possible. You have to spend the time and study your market and look. Well, she did. The first day a duplex came up, she bought it the first day it came up. So she got her duplex. I'm working on her taxes to make sure she can buy another duplex next year. And we did the insurance for her or we're doing it. We, have, we don't have it yet, but we're doing the insurance for her to be able to handle her insurance as well for the property. So we basically are full service uh, for taxes, bookkeeping, and payroll across the country, and we are uh, full service for insurance in Florida. We're also going to be full service for mortgages uh, across the country as well, um, hopefully in about 30 days. But to answer your question, yes, we do do consulting for real estate deals. And that's anywhere in the country. George's question is, is a house rented to a college student income valued at a same cap rate with other houses that are not rented to students? So, um, no, it is not the same cap rate. Normally, um, student housing cap rate is going to be um, not as valuable as regular housing. The reason is because there, with student housing, is more people living in one property. So there's more, there's multiple tenants you have to focus on within a house. Uh, two, the damage is usually more. So that there's a, there's higher, excuse me, there's more labor costs to student housing. And because of that, your cap rates, normally they sell at a higher cap rate than a non-student housing pr uh, property. Just because again, if I'm renting to a family, I'm going to have only one tenant and less likely for damage to happen. Uh, Fishy says, have you used the bigger pockets calculator? If so, do you think it's a good tool? I have not used any calculator. Um, I honestly just do all the calculations myself. Kay says, uh, just joined the live. So sorry. If you already answered this, but how much money would you say is good to start for investing in real estate? So, okay, it really depends on what market you're in. You know, um, it, the market you're in determine, determines how much money you need. So let's just say 3.5% down for whatever the cost of a fourplex would be. So if your fourplex costs 400000 you would roughly need uh, $14,000 plus roughly $5,000 in closing costs. So about $20,000 is sufficient. But... You should have extra cash to fix the property up and in case tenants leave or any issues come up. So the more cash you have, the better. The more cash you have, the better. 
but I would say the minimum you'd need would be close to $20,000. But other than cash, you need to have a good, good credit and you have to have a good tax return because the bank is going to base the, the loan they're going to give you uh, on how much money you're showing you're bringing in. They're not going to take your word and say, oh, you know what? I, um, I'm babysit and I make 40 grand a year, so you should give me a loan. They don't really do that anymore. You have to prove your income. So tax return, credit, and cash. Those three are what matter. And I saw, I noticed all the likes. Thank you guys for the likes. I really appreciate it. Um, and it helps a lot with the algorithm. So I, I appreciate all you guys for smashing the like button. If you haven't already, please smash the like button. So um, Mat Matia says, how could one become your associate? Um, they would live in Florida and for right now, because we're only in person, we're not, we don't have the app up yet. They would live in Florida. They would get the license associated to the job that they're going to be doing and then going from there. So like um, my new associate, uh, Vinny, he actually is um, getting, he's working on getting his uh, mortgage license. Um, uh, MJ says, um, why did you quit Bank of America? Um, well, I had two duplexes at the time. And in addition to the two duplexes, I just bought a seven unit. Okay. So that, that, at that point I had 11 units. So I was, had 11 units. I had my accounting, some accounting clients, right? Cause I would do tax on my side hustle was in addition to renting, I was doing the, the taxes and bookkeeping. And I also was finishing my degree in um, accounting. So going to school full time, had 11 units that I managed myself and I fixed them myself. And then I also was, had my side hustle and I was also competing in powerlifting too. So between all the things I was doing, I was like, all right, let me pull back and focus more of my energy on um, buying more properties. So then over the next, I think, year to two years, I ended up going, I, I ended up buying another um, 12 units to make it 23. There was also a couple of other personal reasons I left, but um, that's uh, all the reasons. So Jason says, what is the best way to educate myself on the market? What sources do you look at, trades, et cetera? So the best way for you to know is actually to go on Zillow and Realtor.com and look at the properties that sold. Then look at the pictures and see what is the condition that they were sold in. Then look at when was they previously purchased? What did it look like at that time as well? So a lot of times why it takes a while to study your market is because you'll see a property and you're like, oh man, this looked like a pretty good deal. This pro this home was sold for 200,000. Then you'd look at it and you're like, oh, these are pretty beat up pictures. Then you go back and you'll see six months later, it was resold. And then you'll see, wow, it was resold for 300,000. And you look at the pictures and you say, oh wow, they, they did a lot of upgrades. So now you see, okay, it's worth 200, not upgraded. They did upgrades and then they sold it for 300. So, um, that's where you kind of get an idea. So then you also need to spend some time studying to see what are the costs of each of these up upgrades, you know? All right. Um, Walid says, I am in Canada, so our economy follows the direction of the U.S. market. How bad do you think the market will go get due to the coronavirus? Extremely bad. It's going to be very, very bad. Um, we have the worst unemployment since the great depression. It's going to be extremely bad. So for people that are saving cash and keeping good credit and keeping a stable job, it's going to be a great opportunity for them because they're going to be able to buy assets at a big discount. I don't think the realist, the stock market is, is accurately showing what the true, what's truly going on in the market, okay? The stock market is not actually showing what's truly going on in the in, in, in uh, Main Street. So it says Wall Street. Wall Street doesn't follow Main Street. What's happening on Main Street is a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people are not going to be able to pay the bills. Yes, you have a rent forbearance, but what happens is in, say, three months, when the rent's due, they got to pay all three months up front. People do not have that money. They have a mortgage forbearance. They'll have a th maybe three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. At the end of the period, they have to pay that money. 
they don't have that money. If they don't, they're going to have to do a refi. They cannot refi. So then they have to do a loan modification. Some of those people are not going to be able to do it because they have no income at all. And if they have no income at all, the bank can't really do a loan modification because they have nothing to modify against. It's like if you got a job and you lost half of your income, then they can do a loan modification and kind of work with you. But they can't work with someone that has no money at all, right? Like you can't help that person. So there's going to be a significant amount of supply of homes for sale. A ton of builders built homes. I've been saying this for a long time. A ton of builders built homes. They're going to be selling those homes the, at cost just so they can get rid of them because those builders didn't pay, build those homes with cash. They went and got a loan from the bank to build it. So the, the bank wants to get their money back. They don't want to keep on paying those loans. So they're going to just sell the property just to get rid of it. On top of that, people just bought a new home. Those people are going to just sell it to get rid of it. People that are lost their jobs are going to sell their homes to get rid of it. So there's going to be a significant uh, volume of, of uh, real estate for sale. So the stock market is going to dip again. That is my prediction. I don't think it doesn't, doesn't make sense that you're telling me that the current stock market uh, valuations are, are the matching 2018. Our market is not as good as 2018. And our recovery is not going to be V-shaped. Mm -mm. I don't, it's not happening. It's not going to be V-shaped. Like our stimulus check was what? 1200 bucks a person that covers bare necessities. The average American couldn't cover $400 emergency at minimum. This is a $4,000 emergency to the average American. So logically 20% of the country is affected. Another, another, another stat I want to bring to you. The American government, the, the, the goal is to have unemployment of roughly, I think, like 3%. So we had a record low unemployment rate, uh, a lot less than, than what the goal was. Yet, 70% of Americans couldn't cover a $400 emergency. So that means if their tires need to be changed, they could not cover the cost of that, changing tires on their car. So you're telling me that this major epidemic happened and 70% of the country can't cover a $400 emergency. And now they have a, a minimum of $4,000 emergency, financial emergency on their hands. And that we're going to miraculously come back. Okay. We're not because as again, the more rent was not forgiven, right? I can't forgive my tenants for the rent. That, where's that money coming from? It's a forbearance. People have to come up. A lot of people are going to default. A lot of people are going to go bankrupt. A lot of people are going to lose their homes. A lot of businesses are going to lose their properties. Many, many businesses are going to go out of, uh, are going to actually shut down for good. They're not going to be able to recover from this. And because of that, it's going to take a while for everyone to get back on their feet. So our, our financial system had a heart attack. There is no V shape from a heart attack. Not a doomsday guy. I'm an optimist. I knew something was going to happen and I've been preparing myself and I am positive that we're going to recover. Is it going to be fee shaped? No, it's not, but we are going to recover. And for those that are ready and prepared, they're going to benefit greatly from it. So get ready guys, get ready to jump in when things are cheap, because this is where you're going to build your wealth. Okay. You get a great opportunity once like every 10 years, and this is your opportunity. So be prepared because it's coming. And you want to be able to build your wealth from it. So, all right, guys, let's get into the next question. So, what about the Indian real estate market in the near future? I think it's a global market that's going to be going down, a global market, not just American market. The, the whole world is going to have an impact from this, you know? This is not just stuck with the United – just like what happened in 08. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, probably a lot of the guys probably don't remember in 08 what happened. Like the whole world took it, uh, suffered, right? Not just America, the whole world suffered. It was a global issue. We're, we're a global, we're a, we have a global economy now, right? No country is really separate from everybody else. We all suffer together, some more than others, but we all suffer together. Um, King Mom says, what books or websites do you prefer to study real estate market? So again, if you want to study your local market, you have to just use Zillow and Realtor and look at all these little deals. 
Uh, you can always get a mentor to review deals with you. So if you found like say 10 deals and you want to set up a consultation, we can review the deals with you guys and help you there. Um, if you guys want a course, I'm thinking about putting out a course, but I really only want to do it if there's really high demand. Otherwise, honestly, I just don't have the time uh, to be doing that, you know? Um, books. Dale Carnegie had to win friends and influence people. That's how you can learn how to talk to people and buyers and tenants. Intelligent Investor, Benjamin Graham. Think and Grow Rich. And um, Rob Kiyosaki, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's a good start for you guys. Jose says, how do you structure your properties for access protection? I think you mean asset protection. So first of all, everyone acts like it's a big deal, like you're going to get sued and no one's going to take your stuff. Okay? So my 23 units, all 23 were in my personal name. Why was I fine with that? It's because I had good insurance that the insurance was going to pay in case anyone got hurt. So if you're cheap on your insurance, yeah, it's going to be a problem. Um, eventually, I put each asset in a different LLC. So then, you know, each LLC has its, is kind of by itself to limit the liability and not be exposed to everything else. S. Max says, what's the best way for me to get a buy and hold for my first deal? It's been hard to get financing without the credit. What's the best way to estimate rehab costs? Um, so one, build your credit. You got 12 months. So go out there, get two or three credit cards and just buy, use them and pay them off. That will build your credit over the next six, over the next 12 months. Okay. So that's step one. Um, two, make sure you have a reliable job so you can be able to get the loan for the property. Uh, three, save up your cash. How do I estimate rehab costs? You literally go through and you would, the best way for you to do it, honestly, you don't have to go and become, spend all your time and, and, and act like you're a contractor. When the time comes for rehab costs, before you actually close on the property, you can bring in a general contractor, bring in two or three of them and say, hey guys, you know, one at a time, hey guys, tell me what it's going to cost to fix this place up. And they're going to give you a bid. And then you could determine what the costs are going to be. Uh, you have three different estimates, so you can really get a good idea of what it's going to cost. And then you're going to figure out, okay, is it really worth it? Not until you do this for, you know, maybe 10 times on 10 different deals, you're not really going to get an idea of what it's going to cost. On average, a bathroom costs 5000 A kitchen costs 15000 Flooring costs 3 to $4 a square foot for material and installation. So painting an in, uh, outside of a property is 3000 Painting the inside of the property is roughly 1500 to 2000 depending on the size. So these are things you just learn over time. You know, roof cost on um, is roughly 10000 Again, depends on the size of the property. So in the type of material you're using. But these are roughly, you, you get that idea over time. It, it, you just, you kind of learn as you grow. You don't have to worry about that right now. Jose says, I've seen many properties listed on Zillow, et cetera, as foreclosures. Is there any way to purchase these other than auction? Sometimes foreclosures are listed on the MLS and it's just, they put a price and you just buy them. Sometimes you have to go through auction. Just because it's auction doesn't mean you have to pay all cash. You could be in all cash, but then you can get a hard money loan because a hard money loan functions like cash. The other option you have is that some auctions do allow you to get a standard mortgage to buy them. But if you're getting a standard mortgage to buy the prop mortgage to buy the property, it depends how bad if it's in a bad condition. Because if it's in a very bad condition, then you have to get a 203k loan. If it's in extremely bad condition, even a 203k loan will not allow it because I think the most you can do is 60 to 70,000 on a 203k loan. So, you know, it's it depends, and you have to kind of figure out what you want to do. Unless you are have a lot of construction experience, you don't want to take on a major remodel because most of the time, you're it's going to be you're not going to do a great job in estimating the the rehab. And even if you do get general contractors to estimate your rehab, it's normally twenty percent higher than what you think it's going to cost. So if you think it's going to be fifty thousand, it's going to be closer to sixty two thousand. 
And this is consistent. Like this is just what it is. And all of the um, contractors that have been doing it forever basically go through the same thing. It, it always ends up being a little bit more because when you open up one wall, there's something behind that wall that you did not expect to be there. And you couldn't expect it to be there because you can't see through walls. So um, next question here is Clark. Clark says, can you get bank loan to get that 3.5% down payment if a multi-unit is around 350000 So you're saying, can you get bank loan to get that 3.5% down payment? Uh, so yes, you can get a 3.5% FHA loan to buy a multi-unit property as long as it's owner-occupied. You can also find different non-for-profits and say cities that will actually give you down payment assistance for the three and a half percent down. You're also able to use your 401k to help for the down payment assistant. You're also able to use a seller's credit as a down payment assistant. So there are many options as a down payment assistant. Sometimes people will go buy a property and try to negotiate down the price. Your other option is not to negotiate down the price, but negotiate the seller to give you a seller's credit for the property. And that seller's credit can be extremely valuable for you, right? Because if he gives you 6%, that is 6% less than you have to bring to the closing table. So even if you do a deal that requires 20% down, right? Say your fourth deal might require 20% down. Well, if you're getting a seller's credit of 6%, and you only have to come up with other 14. It makes it a lot easier to do the deal. Great question, Clark. Max says, thank you. All right, guys. I got seven likes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the likes. Uh, for everyone who hasn't smashed the like button, please smash the like button. Al algorithm likes it. Um, feel free to ask some more questions. Um, I'll be on for a few more minutes. So uh, I definitely want to make sure I answer everybody's questions. This is a great opportunity for you guys to get the quality time with me. Um, and again, please share with your friends. The faster we uh, build our pages up, the faster I build the app, and the faster we all have an opportunity to make a lot of money. So uh, I think with the app, because again, the app is only going to keep about 5%, maybe 10%, depending on how much uh, legal and uh, professional we have to have in the back, um, depending on how many lawyers we need in the back office to make the app work. So if a person is working from home and making, say, $40,000 a year, or not working from home, but working for the bank or a financial institution making $40,000 a year, they should be making eighty dollars to one hundred and twenty dollars working from home. And it's basically doing the same job they would be doing for these different financial, ser uh, financial services for these different banks and companies, but they're doing the same thing at home. So because of the overhead costs being saved, we're able to save give more money to the users and give more money to the consumers that are getting the financial purchasing the financial services from the app. So both benefit, everybody benefits. All right. Uh, Mac, uh, Mac, that's the app I'm actually working on creating. So we've already basically created the outline. We already have the tech company that's going to build it. Uh, we already have everything, but the point is that we basically, they said, there's no point of building it until I have enough following. So once I had a million followers on Instagram and a million followers on YouTube, I'll have enough followers to be able to start producing the app and then be able to get some of those followers to become users of the app. At that point, I'll be able to be successful. So uh, next question I got here from King Mom says, what is the best loan to get to buy your first rental property? So if your first rental property is your first property, you should get an FHA 3.5% down property. So then you're only putting down 3.5% to buy the property. You live on one side, rent out the other three sides. Kay says, appreciate you sharing knowledge. Very helpful and informative. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate that. I got 12 likes. Thanks, guys. Thanks for smashing the like button. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. It helps out with the algorithm. And please, again, share the page with your friends. John says, how much did Millionaire Mentor charge you to post an Instagram page? Is it worth it? Um, normally, their charge is like $500 for a post. Uh, they don't charge me that much because 
I guess they like me. <laughs> uh, I don't anything near that. I don't pay anything near that. Um, Waleed says, is it easy for a Canadian to buy property in the U.S.? It's easy for any foreigner to buy a property in the U.S. It really comes down to putting down the down payment. If they basically you need 30% down to buy a property in the U.S. as a foreigner. And the interest rates are usually higher. But as a foreigner, it might be a better idea for you to buy into a real estate investment group. Because if you're buying into a real estate investment group, you don't need the 30%. One. Two, uh, you're going to be paying property management fee on a smaller property where the investment group is going to manage the property manager as well. So it's going to be usually more profitable to do it that way. But do your research and find out which works out best for you. Uh, Fishy says, is there any programs you know of in California that help with down payments and such? So I don't know because you actually, the down payment programs are based by the lo each locality. So in California, there, there's one city that'll have it and the next city doesn't have it. So you actually have to do your research in your local market, contact realtors, contact non for profits and see there, is there any down payment assistance for first time home buyers? Uh, King mom says, what if I don't live in the property? So then as a first time, first as an investment property, you would need to put down 20%. That is pretty standard. Some places require you to put 25 or 30% down on your, on an investment property. Make sure the rent investment property is a duplex, triplex, or quadplex because it's extremely difficult to make a condo, townhouse, or a single family home profitable. If you don't have enough money, it might be a good idea to partner with someone that knows what they're doing so you can be able to guarantee you're going to make, or not guarantee, but increase the probability for you to make money. Because it's if you're doing it on your own and you don't have a lot of experience and you would have never owned a home and you don't know how things cost to fix, it might be difficult for you to do it. So when you're living in the property yourself, it's kind of easier for you to just live in the worst unit, fix up the other ones, increase your rent, and then eventually fix up your unit uh, along the way. Um, Fishy, do you know th what the minimum credit score banks allow? You can actually have like a 620 or 650, um, you know, but again, there is different levers. There is credit down payment, your tax return, and your consistency of income. So if you have a, a lot of down payment, your credit doesn't matter as much, and your consistency of income doesn't matter as much. But if you have no money, no credit, no job consistency, not a good tax return, then it's going to be hard for you to get a loan. So you have to look at these different aspects and, and see um, you know, where can you improve. Real quick, I want to do a survey with you guys. And please, everyone answer. I got 15 people watching, so please answer. Um, 15 people watching live. If I put out a course, it's called, um, I don't really have a name for it yet, but basically it's the personal finance course where it talks about the five core things for personal finance. And it basically talks about savings, taxes, credit, uh, talks about um, investing and explains a lot of the basics that no one's really told or taught. These are all the things that I learned along the way that I think are the basics people need to know um, to just have a very good foundation, foundation right? So um, I guess I'll call it the foundations of personal finance and FPF. Um, so... Would people, would you guys be interested in something like that? Because again, to be honest with you, I don't mind doing anything for you guys, but I just think about it. I only have time from nine to 10 o'clock at night. After 10, I'm still working. And before then I'm working and spending time with my family. So I really have a limited time. So if I create a course, I really need to actually, people actually have to want to buy it because otherwise it's just really a big drain of my time. Cool, cool. Um, honestly, I don't have a price, right? It's gonna be like, it's gonna be like five sections, five sections. So they're gonna be roughly maybe like five half an hour to an hour long video and um, written information. So and I and I don't, 
I haven't bought a course in a long time, right? It's been like 15 years since I bought a course. So I don't know what they go for. So like, what does it normally sell for? You guys tell me what you think is worth. I'm, I'm not, I know it sounds weird, right? People don't say that, but I'm being honest with you guys. I hope you guys can appreciate my honesty. Yeah, I also like doing these late, late, late night lives. Um, but, you know, so only so many hours a day and only so much content you can give out in this format to be absorbed. That's why I keep telling people, come to the live. They'll ask me a question in the DM. I'm like, I cannot answer a 15-minute explanation in a DM through text. And I have literally over probably 200 DMs. I, I literally don't even have the time to answer all of them. Um, um, the guru is charged around 10 K. No, nah, I don't want to charge 10 K for like two hours and a half to five hours of content. Um, a lot of people told me I should be charging like a thousand dollars for it, but I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? While you guys thinking about that, I want to answer, uh, Matia's question. Um, she says, would you rather look for properties in bigger cities rather than small towns? I'd actually rather invest in uh, secondary and tertiary markets. So I don't invest in Tampa. I invest in like downtown Safety Harbor, downtown Dunedin, downtown Tarpon, downtown S Safety Harbor. Uh, I don't know if I said that. Um, I invest in downtown areas because they're a lot of action. But I don't invest in downtown Tampa because the cap rates are so compressed and the, it, the competition is like not really there. And so it's not my thing. Now, if I was in Tampa, but I was like slightly in the outskirts in a great downtown market, then I would invest in there. So you don't want to be super small and you don't want to be super large, but you want to be just right. You want to be in the cities where people go hang out when people are tired of hanging out in the big city. They're like, oh, you know, I want to go hang out here. That's where you want to invest. And you want to invest in kind of like working class um, properties because they're always going to be rented. So you're going to get to consistency. Once you build enough of those, then you can go into different options. Um, do you, oh, so Max says, how do we get the deal consultation? Uh, send me a DM on IG and my assistant will get to it and work on putting you on the schedule. Um, next question is from Walid. Do you have a property investment group? Uh, yes, I have a property investment group. I just opened one up 2020 before then I didn't have one. And in 2020, I opened one up. Um, and within literally like the day the deal was done, we are, we, we, one investor put up all the money for that deal. So, um, we're going to be having a lot of deals to come. So if you guys, again, do not rush because if you buy a deal now, you can literally just wait 12 months and you'll make double, triple the money on the deals that are going to come. Because think about this. If you buy a $500,000 property, now put down $100,000 in an investment group. If you wait to a year from now, that $500,000 property is going to go for four hundred. dollars You'll only need to put down $80,000 as an investment group. And one day, it's going to go back to five hundred. dollars So that $80,000 made a hundred thousand dollars of profit and eventually is going to go even higher than that. I'm using half a million dollars as an example, but I think you're getting it. It's going to be easy to double our money when this market tanks. So be patient because we don't want to baby money. We want to make significant money and the market's going to tank and we're going to be able to make it. So let's be patient to buy those great deals. Um, All right. And then it says, uh, John says, thanks. I gave the 13th like. Laugh out loud. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you, John. I appreciate all the likes. I appreciate the love. I really do. I really enjoy seeing that new follower on YouTube. I really like, it's like, all right, I'm doing something. People are gaining value from it and it makes me feel good. I like investing in you guys. One day I want to see you guys come up to me at somewhere and say, Pascal, your advice helped me. I made millions of dollars in real estate. I appreciate it. Thank you. Blah blah blah. And um, that's gonna make me feel really good, you know. And then maybe we'll uh, can collaborate one day with something. All right. Um, 
Fishy says, what other Instagram pages do you recommend we follow to keep us motivated? Uh, millionaire mentor, millionaire uh, mentor is good um, to follow, keep us motivated. I like Manny Koshibin, right? Like I like it because I have a lot of uh, similarities with him. Um, not being born in the country, going through a really rough time. I feel a lot of similarities with Gary V. You should follow Gary V. I also came, he came to the country when I was three and moved to New Jersey. I came to the country when I was three and moved to New Jersey, both from countries that have a lot of persecution for, for, our, for, uh, for his people and for my people and came from nothing, failed the fourth grade, got health back, just had a lot of problems growing up, a lot of issues, a lot of things that more people would be like, oh, you know, you had a lot of things going against you and were able to overcome those issues and be able to get stronger from them. So kind of Manny Koshman, Gary Vee, I find a lot of similarities in them and me. They're older than me, so I kind of look up to them to say, hey, they did it. They pushed it. They love what they do. I love what I do. I'm going to get there too. And um, I'm trying to put out that same thing um, to the people that follow me to say, look, I made it. I'm 34. I put in the hard work. It is hard work, but it is worth it. And sometimes people say like, well, why do you show the car? And, and why do you say show money sometimes? I'm not, I have never sold anything on my page. So let's just start there. So it's not like me showing stuff to try to sell something, right? It's me showing because I feel proud that I'm able to accomplish this. I have not shown my house yet really, right? I've not really shown anyone my house. You'll see me once in a while by the pool talking. I have the largest house in my neighborhood with the largest lot in my neighborhood. And I'm like the youngest person that owns a house in my neighborhood. But I don't really like do it. I'm not going to go out there bragging, but I'm proud of being able to be at this level. My mom wanted me to buy a house by her. My wife wanted a certain type of house. My kids probably needed a certain type of things I wanted to give them. And I wanted a three-car garage, and I wanted a nice back porch. So I found this house, and I got everyone what they needed. But I'm not going to go and flash it around. But I like cars, so I'm going to show cars. And I like motivating people because when I found out how much certain people made, when I was 19, 20, and I sat in the bank and I was doing work for this one guy, he's a Greek dude, and he's like talking to him. And my manager told me like, oh, this guy owns the bank. And I'm like, what do you mean he owns the bank? He owned the building that the bank rents from him. Bank of America rents from this guy, right? And he also owns the Walgreens next door. And he also owns the medical center next door. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, wow, you own a lot of stuff. He's like, yeah. He's like, I own all the Walgreens up and down US 19 to Georgia. All the Walgreens up and down US 19 to Georgia. And the dude's like 55, 60, or like he wasn't that old, like 50 to 60 years old. And I'm like, if you don't mind, I'm like, how did you start? He's like, well, back in the 80s, I only had like say $80,000 and I bought some land. And then I, the, the Walgreens wanted me, wanted me to build a building for them. So I built the building and I got a loan for the bank to build it and I leased it to them. And then I did it again and again and again. So then I bought, built every single Walgreens up and down US 19 to Georgia. And I said, if you don't mind me asking, how much are you worth? Because I'm that crazy kid. And I'll still do that today because I have, I, I don't look at it like that type of way. Some people take it a different way, but I don't. He told me he's worth $650 million. And that was like, 14 years ago, 13 years ago. So that means accounting for inflation, the dude's worth like $1.2 billion now. Now my math's probably off because I'm super excited right now, but he's worth a shitload of money. The dude bought, I remember I have like a small little resort in Safety Harbor. The dude bought the Safety Harbor resort, like the historic resort that's like 120 rooms. rooms. He paid... I think like, I forgot how much he paid for it. You know, it's around $10 million. He invested a million dollars into uh, upgrades and added around $14 million in value. And these things this guy told me he did and what he has and, what, and all the things, I was like, I want to do that. I want to do what this guy's doing. And that motivated me. And that's why I do the, say the things that I say and, and, and things like that. So uh, none of it really matters that much to me. Like I really do enjoy cars, but none of it really matters to me. 
it, I enjoy the fact that I'm able to, to finally say, hey, look, I validated myself that I am good and I can make it. And it doesn't matter that I got left back. It doesn't matter all the crap people used to talk. I made it. So um, you guys can make it too. But you have to put in the work. Let me let me get let me throw that out there because a lot of people don't understand. I'm not saying this shit's easy. You got to put in work. But let me tell you something else. Nothing is easy. Believe that. Nothing is easy. One. I'll leave you know one more story. I bought. I had some property in the hood, and again, I fixed the properties myself. So I'm out there fixing the stuff, and there's this guy and his girlfriend, and yo, like, she was like screaming at him. Whatever. They just had a baby together, and they're like going. She's going crazy on him. And he's like 20 years old and they have, he has a baby with this girl and he can barely hold a job and whatever. That shit's hard. That shit's a lot harder than trying to figure out how to do the, make the real estate game happen, right? So there's a lot of people having hard, a hard life. I'm going to say everybody has a hard life in a different aspect in some sort. But I'd rather choose the hard life and choose the benefits I'm going to get from it. Instead of life choosing my hard life and then probably not even getting a benefit from it. So back to the questions. All right. The guru is charged like around 10K. Don't be like them. K, K says, I found you through Millionaire uh, Mentors page and followed you instantly. So far, it has been worth it 100%. Matt Ja says, if you plan on building your audience, you should keep doing as you do right now. Just keep giving value to others. Follow followers will come. Thank you. Jason says, how can we find out about those great deals that you're mentioning? You're not going to really need to find out about them. They're going to just start coming out. Like in 12 months, all of these people are going to start selling their – what's, what's going to happen? In 12 months, the builders are going to sell their house at deep discount. The people who just bought a house two years ago are going to sell their house at a deep discount. Um, all the people who lost their jobs and are no longer getting forbearances and can't do a loan modification are going to sell their houses at deep discounts. Not just people who lost their jobs, but all the people that owned restaurants. All these businesses that have been shut down for two to three months. They don't have the cash reserves. They're also going to shut down. They're also going to lose their home. And all of this real estate is going to come up for sale. And this is the thing we got to understand. It is a very simple supply and demand. The supply that's going to hit the market is going to be so large that the demand out there, the demand meaning the people who can actually buy, not the people who want it, because everyone's going to want to buy the deals, that who can actually afford to buy it is few. Because of that, when demand is, is low and the supply is high, it's simple economics. Price drops. So price drops are going to happen like crazy. So... The deals are just going to be there. The home that you were looking at that was worth, or the property you were looking at that was worth five hundred thousand is going to drop to four hundred thousand. Might drop to three fifty. So you just have to be prepared to wait to buy it, to be patient, because it's going to come. You don't really have to look hard. You don't have to go to a wholesaler at that point. They're literally going to be on the MLS, and they're going to be like, "Please just buy this deal." But you have to make sure you have your cash in order, your credit in order, your tax return in order, or find the right partners to team up with. Right, like right now, I'm not taking anybody onto my investment group because there isn't any deals to buy, and I'm not going to buy a bad deal. But soon, we're going to have a lot of great opportunities. So just be patient, and they're going to come. All right, uh, next question. Can I contact you by DMing on IG? Uh, yes, my assistant will be able to respond. Um, Jason says, hell yeah, extremely valuable and appreciated. Candy Apple, when you say the market is going to drop significantly in a year, are you just talking about U.S. solely? Actually, no. I think it's going to drop globally, to be honest with you. I think it's going to be a global market. Uh, a global market is obviously affected, and it's going to be a global recession. Um, I do believe so, because even if China keeps pumping money to their people to with all these um, bailouts, right? When the U.S. market is not going to be buying their products as much as they used to, it's going to suffer. It's going to go down. Everyone's going to go down. Zambino says it's hard 
work, but you've had a smile the whole time. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've had some hard blows, right? I've had, to, honestly, I had times when in 08, when I had eight units empty and I did everything I freaking could. And I literally, I'll be honest, I was crying at the kitchen table in front of my mom. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to make it out of this. And she's like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And, and it was tough times. It was really tough times. But I said, I'm not going to spend my whole life because again, I've been studying since I was 14. And I was like 24, 25 at that time. So I spent 11 years to build up to build up this company or build up this empire, build everything I did, worked it, literally fixed shit with my own hands, figured out everything. And then I literally did every single part that I could proper to, to lose. So I literally worked like 80 hours a week fixing everything myself, managing the property myself, renting myself. I did the evictions myself. I didn't even get a lawyer. And I made it out there. I made it out of it. And now that I made it out of it, I made it out super profitable. So having grit in any business is extremely important because it's not going to be easy. There's going to everything in the world is going to push you out. All your friends and family is going to say, get out of the deal. Everyone's going to say, just go bankrupt and forget about it. And some will. And when those people do that quit soon, I'm going to go there and finally buy those deals because I'm not going to quit. I know it's a winning plan and I'm not going to deviate my, from my plan when the world's trying to freak me out and have me get out of it. It's going to be like my last post. Everything's going on sale. No one runs away from Macy's when they have a sale. They run in and I'm going to run in and I'm going to stay in even though it's going to get really tough, right? You just got to stick to it. So uh, next question. Um, it's hard work, but you've had a smile the whole time and the heaviest table. I don't understand the heaviest table. Um, when you say the market is, okay, it says Candy Apple, house tour. <laughs> I think I did a little bit of tour of that table that I had built. It's a really nice table. It's like the 14 and a half foot Paroga table. Um, Kay says, what type of cars do you have or are you into? So I have a classic car, which is a 1978 Datsun 280Z. And the engine is a 2015 Corvette LS3 engine. It does about 500 horsepower to the wheels and the car weighs about 2350. Uh, so it's a manual transmission and it does not have traction control. Um, and it has drum brakes. So you are just kind of prepare to die, you know, because it's stupid fast and you better know how to drive. Otherwise, you're, it's, it's not good. It's not good. But it's it's a high adrenaline car. And then my other car is a, a, a BMW i8. I think you've probably seen them in my videos. Um, B Enlightened says, I'm trying to be as present as possible, but it's hard because there are giving last dance on they are giving Last Dance on ESPN. It's a documentary on the Bulls in the 90s. Jordan, Pippen, Ron, and Kira. Love your content. So be enlightened. Like I mentioned before, the real estate market is going to try to distract you. Your family and friends are going to put stuff in your head saying, hey, get out of, get out of the market. Get out of the real estate market. Sell, build bankrupt, whatever. Like people told me the same thing. And I'm like, I'm not listening. So you're going to choose to stop focusing on something and focus on what you want. It is very easy to go on Instagram and like follow all, all these like IG models and to show off their body and whatever. And hey, you got a nice body. That's that's really nice. But I don't want to get distracted by your nice body. So I'm not going to follow you. I only follow business people. I only follow car people. I only follow on the th things I want to grow. And sports are nice. But if you focus too much on sports, you got to have a, what are you going to benefit from it, right? So I chose to make business my sport. I made investing my sport. I'm going to try to figure out the best way to make more money, to get the best deals, to add the most value. And once you do that, you can more and more find passion. Walid says, if you don't already follow Patrick uh, Bet Davis, you definitely should. 
So Patrick De uh, Bet David it has Valuetainment. So I do follow Valuetainment. Can you tell us the process how banks calculate rent from three units in your income to qualify us to buy a quadplex? Well, um, they're going to actually not remember the fourplex you're buying is going to be rented already. So then I have to calculate rent. They're going to have actual contracts on the. So when I buy a fourplex, right? Let's ignore the fact that I'm going to live in one side. Let's just say right now, today, when I buy fourplexes, I don't live in it, right? And I'm not going to do three and a half percent down because I'm an investor. So I have to put down 20% in as an investor, sometimes even 30%. So they're going to take what's the current rent from the leases and they're going to use those rents to bring in the gross income. So the duplex I bought five, six years ago, six years ago, um, the rents were like five to six hundred a month. So the rents were say twenty two hundred dollars, right? Roughly, I think it's twenty two or twenty dollar, twenty forty a month. So two thousand forty dollars a month. From there, they're going to take out the taxes and the insurance, the water, sewer, garbage, right? And then they're going to calculate what the mortgage payment's going to be after you put down your down payment. And then they're going to see is normally it's one point two five ratio. So that means two thousand forty dollars minus the utilities and certain expenses, what is left over? That leftover amount needs to be 1.25 or greater than the mortgage taxes and insurance. Okay? So let's just say, let's make believe 2,000 income minus $1,000 in expenses, you're left with $1,000. Your mortgage taxes and insurance needs to be um, the, the, the remaining amount needs to be uh, more than or at least 1.25 times your mortgage taxes and insurance, which means your mortgage taxes and insurance needs to be about 800 bucks in that example. So your mortgage uh, broker will help you calculate those numbers. But once you calculate it a few times, you'll get the idea, and then you're going to be able to calculate it yourself again and again. You'll be able to put it in an Excel spreadsheet and access it that way, and then start plugging the numbers in and you'll be able to see. So once the deals come in nine to 12 months, if you're looking at duplex, triplex, or quadplex, almost every deal you look at is going to be able to qualify for a loan. So the point is not looking for deals to qualify for a loan. You're going to try to look for the best deal possible in a great neighborhood. That's going to really be your focus. Um, Zambino says, so that defines how much of a down payment you need the 1.25? No, that does not define the down payment you need. That is the minimum debt coverage ratio that they're going to be looking for, which is more so of what uh, John was asking. John was saying, can you tell us the process, how banks calculate rent from the three units and your income to qualify for to buy the quadplex? So they're going to be taking the rental income to qualify for the quadplex. Not Most of it's going to be rental income, not even your, your income. Your income is going to play a, a small part of it. Um, that's why it's good to buy a triplex because, or a quadplex, because it makes it easier for you to qualify for, because again, when I bought, I was only making $23,000 a year as a banker. So I was able to buy these deals because the property was making money. So not only did my income add to qual to covering the mortgage amount, the tenant's income was also adding to my income to help qualify for the mortgage. So it made it actually easier, not harder. So that's, that's a misconception people have that it's hard to do a fourplex. It is actually easier if you buy a good deal. It is easier to do a fourplex deal than it is to buy a house. You know, After you get your fourplex, maybe one or two of them, then if you really want to get a house, go get a house. Now don't go crazy and get a, a mansion or a huge house. Just get something that's comfortable. But if you can keep buying another another and keep on buying these multi-units, then you're going to benefit better in the long run. The longer you wait, the longer you hold off on getting that gift of the house or gift of that, that car that you really want, the bigger that gift will become later. I said, if I don't get a GTR, I don't want any car. So finally, what is it? I didn't end up getting a GTR. I got an I-8. But I, and I had about almost 30 units, and it made it very easy and affordable to, to buy that toy. 
So the 1.25 ratio is not how, how much the down payment you need. Again, most down payments, if you're doing FHA, 3.5% down, you'll only need 3.5% down, which is 3.5% of the purchase price plus at around $5,000 to closing costs. So, all right. Any other questions? Guys, it was a really great talking to everybody. The hour and a half flew by. Um, I got 14 likes. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, if you guys haven't already, smash the like button. I really appreciate all the love. I really appreciate sharing all the content with your friends. Um, I'll answer this one last question, and then I will say goodbye. John says, I see Marhaba Pascal. Marha means hello. Uh, I'm planning to get a quad, but to live in one of the units to start my RIA investing. My concern is I don't know how much I could afford with my income plus from tenants, so bank will. Give me the loan. Like, will I be able to afford 300K or 500K for a quad? Well, John, it's I need to know how much you make, right? That's the first question is what do you make monthly? After I know how much you make monthly, then from that income, you have to consider how much credit card debt you have and how much car loans you have uh, or any other debts to because that's going to reduce the, your, your monthly amount of your debt coverage. From there, you're, you're going to be able to have a remaining amount. And that remaining amount conservatively is 35% of that cash amount is what you can be used for a monthly payment towards a loan. So let's just say you made $5,000 a month and you had no credit card debt and no car loans. You can use 35% of the 5,000 conservatively. Some people will go up as high as 45% and even 50%, but it's very, very rare. 35% um, of 5,000 is $1,750 a month. $1,750 a month is going to cover mortgage taxes and insurance. Now, if that, uh, that property has tenants that are paying rent, those tenants are going to help cover the expenses of the property as well. So if you're bringing in $1,750 a month, you should be able to uh, afford a $500,000, or if you're making $5,000 a month, you should be able to afford a $500,000 $500, quadplex pretty easily. It should be pretty easy for you to afford that on um, that type of income. So, um, yeah. Max says, are seller financing deals hard to do for beginners? No, they're actually pretty easy to do. That is why you need to read the book, Dale Carnegie, How to Win, win Friends and Influence People. When you're getting a seller finance deal, I got a seller finance deal for my seven-unit property when I was 21. I got a seven-unit property, seller finance deal. The other fourplex I, I mentioned in the examples on my uh, Instagram posts, that was also a seller finance deal for the quadplex that is worth over half a million now that I bought for $180,000. You need to know how to talk to people so they want to work with you. They, so they can you can build the confidence in them that you're going to take care of them, that you're going to take care of the property. You're going to make sure you make the payments for them because they're going to need that money to live on for the retirement. And they don't have to worry about the tenants, the property. You're going to handle all of that. You're going to make sure they get their money consistently with any without any issues from the tenants. And on top of that, when they, buy, when they sell you the property as an owner finance deal, they don't have to take the big tax hit because if they sell you the property and you get paid off between your down payment and the bank, they're going to have to claim all of that on their taxes. So they're going to take the tax hit. But if they give you a seller uh, financing, they only have to claim the amount of money that you pay them each year. So it reduces their tax liability. And it's beneficial for both parties. They get the money and the interest, not the bank. Now, when you say that to a seller, you say what they get, not what you get, what they get. Anyone, tell me, when did I say, where did I say to them, the seller, my benefit of the seller finance deal? You know, please, can you please help me? 
You know, I really could really use, use the help of you giving me a seller finance deal because the bank won't give me a loan. It doesn't work like that, guys. What is in it for them? If you say it that way, Dale Carnegie, how to win info, how to win friends and influence people. Read the book. It will show you that you need to focus on the other people. How can you help them? And if you find where it is that their benefit comes, you show that you care, show that you know what you're talking about. They're going to want to work with you. John says, boom, that helps a lot. We'll catch you next week. Have a good night. Guys, I appreciate all the thumbs up, smashing the like button. I appreciate sharing it with your friends. I appreciate spending this time with you guys. You guys are awesome. Again, really enjoying this, uh, helping all you guys, and I want to see you guys be, be successful. So I'll be live again Wednesday night on YouTube. I'll see you guys then. Have a blessed night.